Yes, welcome to another edition of Gopher Football Weekly with P.J. Fleck. It's a game week edition, game day, in more ways than one this week. Yes, ESPN College Game Day, and it is game day. Minnesota and Michigan, Saturday at TCF Bank Stadium. It's a 6.30 kickoff. We'll take care here on the network. The radio uh, guys will uh, greet you at 4.30. Justin Gard is with us, and for those watching uh, on the Internet, Gard's, he's, uh, I don't know, he's stalking somebody. He's out in a drive. <laughs> Uh, this is weird. Sitting in a car. Sitting yeah. in his car. Yeah, I'm sitting in the sitting in the minivan here at the kids' elementary school. Got to pick them up here in a few minutes. You know, as we uh, we try to juggle everything in 2020, I'm working my way through some stuff. But couldn't miss the first game week episode of Go for Football Weekly, even if it's just for a couple of minutes. Yeah, well, we, we have to say goodbye to Guardsy. I know that'll break uh, Coach Fleck's heart that uh, Guardsy won't get the whole hour here with us today. But uh, uh, we, you got to do what you got to do. I'm hoping the the uh, the uh, school officials don't call the cops and say there's some weird guy hanging out in the park. I was. I'm actually hoping. I was hoping that somebody from the Minnetonka Police Department got called so I could show him the Zoom and say, "No, I'm talking. I'm talking to Coach. I'm talking to Grimmer." Um, not doing anything nefarious in here as I hold up my phone and I've got a little tripod in here. It's quite a setup here that we got, but I'll do the best I can for the, for the minutes that I'm here. It is 2020. That's for sure. And, and uh, certainly uh, coach wanted to ask you first of, you know, in terms of 2020 and uh, more bad news rolling in on Sunday, although there is some celebration to the idea as well. When someone lives a hundred years and lives the life that Sid Hartman lived, there's some uh, time to, uh, to take a moment to one, remember, to be sad a little bit, certainly, but also to think about what a life, what a life, huh? What a life. I mean, a hundred years. And, you know, we had our first here talk yesterday, uh, helping end racism with education and had uh, professor, Dr. William Jones in to speak to our team. And he, he focused on the, the March on Washington back in 1963. And to think that Sid Hartman and the March on Washington was older at that time than I am now, right? <laughs> That just shows what this man saw in his lifetime. Uh, what a gracious man, a man who loved his job, his career and work and never looked at it that way. Uh, I used him as an example today in our, our team meeting about if you can literally live your life like Sid Hartman, find something you absolutely love and you'll never work a day in your life. And he's a perfect example of that. I mean, he was writing articles basically right up until he died. Uh, and he's been writing and covering go for football for 75 years. So there wasn't retirement to him. There wasn't, I need to stop doing what I'm doing. He found something that was him. And he is always, and uh, he, he was and always will be Minnesota. And he'll always be so near and dear to my heart, as well as so many go for fans, go for coaches from the past and uh, everybody who ever came in contact with Sid. He's just uh, a very special man and will be dearly missed. And you think about the, uh, you know, the uniqueness of him in that um, right up until you're 100 years old, as you mentioned, you're working. I mean, the day he died, there was an article that he wrote in the newspaper that morning, which you think <laughs> about that as, as, as a guy who was 100. Um, and obviously, he's a unique guy. He had some quirks. He had some interesting things where, um, you know, I, we could tell, right? We all, and that's what we're going to do for the next, uh, you know, well, forever. We'll tell Sid Hartman stories. But at the end of the day, he was so competitive. He was so relentless. He was so dogged about wanting a story. And uh, I'm sure you experienced a lot where he'd say, hey, come over here. You've got to answer this question and don't tell anybody else the answer. It's got to be you tell me the answer, right? You, he wanted to have that info that nobody else ever was able to get. He wanted it first. You're going to give that to me first, right? You're going to tell me <laughs> that first, right? And he, he wanted everything first. He was willing to interrupt anybody at any time during a press conference, no matter where you were in your question. When Sid spoke, everybody else stopped. And, and I think that just shows, and that wouldn't be... I don't know if that would be appropriate and accepted from anyone else but Sid Hartman, Correct. where whether it's, you know, Meg Ryan or, or, or Andy Greeter or somebody answering, a, asking a question and mid sentence, they'd be interrupted. Uh, probably because Sid couldn't hear him. Right. It wasn't that he was being rude. He just he thought the room was silent. Like, why aren't anybody? Why isn't anybody asking questions? And then he asked the question and with complete class and dignity, they all just stopped talking and let Sid have that moment. I don't think that would be accepted uh, from any other reporter. Uh, they have the respect amongst each other that, you know, when somebody's talking not to do that. And if Sid ever did it, they stopped. Uh, and he was the ultimate reporter. Uh, he always wanted the story first. I mean, I'd have my press conference, and then I'd also have the Sid Hartman press conference, <laughs> which there should have been a reality show just for that 
press conference. If there was a camera in there on Sid and I for the last three years, four years, uh, we would have sold a lot, a lot of film. So uh, he will be dearly missed. Uh, gosh, it just every time I talk about him, I smile. I never knew how many pictures I had of Sid in my office until right. yesterday. When everywhere I look, there's either a bobblehead or a picture with him and my children uh, who, you know, I, I didn't grow up with my grandfathers. I didn't know my grandfather. So I kind of pushed my kids when they were here to sit. And he was he was so grandfather like to them and uh, accepted them with open arms. And whether it's with Heather or my kids or my family, there's so many pictures of sit around my office of certain moments we had with him. Uh, and I'm just. You, you lose a close personal friend. I mean, even during the pandemic, I mean, he was over at the house. He'd stop over in the driveway at social distance and make sure he got his interview. And he didn't want to do it with Zoom and he didn't want to do it on a call. He wanted to come to the house and get it face to face. Even if it was with the window rolled down in the driveway, Sid was going to find a way to get his story differently than everyone else. Well, I'm curious, you know, because I obviously grew up with them and it was Sunday mornings driving to church, listening to WCCO, the sports huddle. And then getting into the business, like everybody knew who he was. I'm always curious when a quote unquote outsider, someone who didn't grow up here, comes in the first day. And there's a great picture of you guys on, on your first press conference in the indoor club room there, where he's like three days off of hip surgery, by the way, at 95 years old. And he makes it to your press conference. But what's your, I'm sure on the plane from Kalamazoo, Paul Rovnak or somebody's like, okay, there's this guy named Sid. You may have heard of him. He's going to be in the front row, most likely. He's going to want to talk to you. I'm always curious what the first impression is of Sid because as Grimmer said and you said he's unique and there's not many like him and we all know it we're used to it but you coming in a whirlwind day all of a sudden here's Sid well that was the first person I had to meet uh that's what Paul Rovnak said you have to meet this guy you're gonna love this guy and this guy's gonna be uh basically your biggest supporter and your biggest fan Paul said as long as you win <laughs> and uh and but it was amazing because the first time I met Sid, it was up in the press conference and Sid sitting right there in the front row. And I knew exactly who he was because I got I, I obviously looked him up on the way over here. And remember, I don't I wasn't from Minneapolis. I, di right. I didn't do much with Minneapolis. I didn't know much about Minneapolis, uh, even sports. Right. And so I don't know much about the guy. And I meet him. I meet him afterwards and I get taken to a private room with him to have a one on one interview. And he hands me a book. And the book he hands me is Sid Hartman's favorite Minnesota sports moments, right? I mean, we've all seen the Sid Hartman book that he, you know, produced and published and did everything with. I have 75 copies of that book because every time he would see me somehow, some way, he'd give me another one. So he gave me one the first day, and I have that one in my office. But then I also have a stack of the same <laughs> book behind my office that I give out to people who maybe come to the Twin City area for the first time that – don't know much about Sid Hartman or somebody who moves to the area, somebody in the neighborhood, I'll give this book. Uh, and I think it was his way of making sure that I knew how special he really was yeah, uh, yeah. and how, how many moments he actually saw and how much more he would ever know than I would. But he also was paying it forward and he was making sure that he knew that I would take that book, pass it to somebody else to make sure they knew how special Minnesota sports really were. Well, guards, you mentioned the sports huddle. And of course, I think every gopher coach, you know, uh, football coach has been on that show since it started, whatever it was, 40 some years ago. And that's become, <laughs> I'm sure for you, a Sunday, a Sunday ritual, whether it's sitting at your, uh, you know, your uh, breakfast bar at your house, or if you're on the road recruiting Sunday morning, whatever, whatever it was when it was PJ flex time to be on, you had to have the cell phone ready. Had to have the cell phone ready. That, I'm really going to miss that time. Uh, not only that, the Murray gift cards he used to give us. And anytime Heather and I went to Murray's because of him, we, we'd go sit in the Sid Hartman booth. Uh, so anytime we go to Murray's, Tim knows we sit in the Sid Hartman booth. And that's the only one we want to sit in. Do you have any, like, funny stories that you can share with us, maybe <laughs> about an encounter that you can tell that, 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 uh, that people would appreciate with, with just, as we said, he's so unique. Uh, we're going to be able to tell Sid stories forever, some on the air, some we can't tell on the air. <laughs> <laughs> you, a, you, you know what? I, I, I can tell some, but not they're probably not as funny as ones I can't tell. Right. Uh, but I remember we were, um, you know, he had, he had some people that, you know, you know, Lacey took care of him and everybody knows that. He had some handlers that kind of take him to where he was. And I remember he came in with these pants and <laughs> they were these baby blue pants and they, they were somewhat stylish, I would say. Uh, for a man that was uh, 99 years old at the time. And he walks in and he goes, uh, I dress like you today. 
And I was like, what are you talking about? I've never worn those before in my life. I like, he's like, I wanted to look young. And I said, listen, <laughs> man, you, the quote that he said, I wanted to look young at 99 is exactly who Sid Hartman was. So if you recall, I have my baby blue pants now which were the color, and I call them my Sid Hartman pants. And so I'm going to wear those on very special occasions for Sid for the rest of my life, I'm sure, because he was uh, he considered himself a fashion guru at, at 99 years old and wanted to make sure that he said he was he was changing his wardrobe to dress like me. And I, I took that as a somewhat of a compliment at, at that particular time. Uh, but uh, there were so there's so many different stories. I mean, I remember going to his 100, or 100, or, uh, 99th birthday. Uh, and it was like the who's who of Minnesota. Yeah. And I, I guess I, I knew who Sid Hartman was, and I, I knew how big of a deal he was. And then when I went to this birthday party, first of all, Sid was in the middle, but Sid never talked to anyone. It was a birthday party for Sid, but Sid just ate. He didn't, he didn't really talk to anyone. Everybody else was just talking to each other. But I was probably like a 99 out of 100 on the depth chart of the people that were actually at this lunch uh, for his birthday, and I just couldn't believe the people that came from out of town for a 99th birthday for Sid Hartman that I was like, that's impressive. Like, that, that is, that person knew this guy 50 years ago, and they showed up for his 99th birthday, and they don't even live here, and they just came in for a lunch. That just shows the measure of a man uh, when you start to see who shows up for sp uh, a special moments in their life, and that just shows the impact Sid had on so many. Yeah, you think about that network of his close personal friends. I think uh, the, the legendary Steve Cannon, another uh, legendary radio host here, he used to go on with him in the afternoons years ago, and that and he kind of dubbed that close personal friend thing. But you think about how hard he worked on making phone calls every single day. Um, and then over the course of 75 years, I don't think I'm out of line saying that Sid Hartman probably broke the most stories of any reporter ever, whether it's news, whether it's sports, whether it's whatever uh, subject you want, uh, 75 years of working like he did and the network of close personal friends he could call upon to get news. I mean, he was breaking stories of, of, of the Notre Dame coach uh, deciding to, uh, you know, retire back in the day. And he's here in Minneapolis. So, you know, I, he, he's probably number one in the history of stories broken, I would think, and which tells you again about, you know, how relentless he was. He was relentless. I mean, if he wanted a question, <laughs> he wanted a question answered, you were going to make sure you answered that question. And if you didn't answer the question and you went around the question, he'd make sure he told you, well, you didn't answer the question. Uh, but I I'm going to really miss it. He had this, he had this, he had his own questions. So he, he could care less what anybody else asked. He had his agenda. He had 10 to 15 questions and his pad of paper, which a lot of times had food all over it. Right. And yeah. And it was it was right there. And he'd pull out of his pocket and he'd read those 10 to 15 questions. And um, he'd always ask for what else you got. The last question he always asked me was, what else you got? What else can you tell me that you're not telling anyone else? <laughs> uh, which is a brilliant question for a reporter because and we had that relationship. And sometimes I gave it to him and sometimes I didn't give him anything. And he'd harass me for five more minutes after that about why I'm not giving him an answer uh, and wouldn't let me leave. So. I'm really going to miss him. He's, uh, uh, he's, uh, he became a really, really close friend. And for someone who didn't, uh, that he didn't have to like, or he didn't have to treat really well from day one. And I know he's part of the media, but from day one, uh, he treated me so well. Uh, he, he would, he talked me through certain things. Uh, I would ask him, uh, how he would handle a certain situation by knowing the landscape of Minnesota. How would you handle the position I'm in right now? And at 98, 99 years old, he would give me an answer. Um, and it was, it was always well thought out immediately. He already had an answer for me and he was willing to share that. Um, I'm really going to miss him. Uh, he became a really close friend in a very short amount of time. And, and, uh, for all the people who knew him for 50, 40, 30, 20 years, uh, um, I feel bad for all them, too, because we, we lost a really special one. And uh, I know we lost uh, an important gopher forever and an ally who uh, really helped me through a lot of diff uh, difficult times. Well, and certainly we'll continue to celebrate and remember. And, um, and I know there'll be a special, uh, special spot Saturday for, uh, for Sid Hartman uh, when the Michigan Wolverines come to town for that little brown jug.
which when you think about it, the little brown jug, the origins of which were uh, only 17 years older than uh, than Sid himself. <laughs> he was 17 when that thing started. He drank, <laughs> he drank from the original. He drank from the original. The little brown jug, the origins were 1903. Uh, Sid was born in 1920, you know, or 1919, whatever. I, I guess I'm not sure exactly when it was. But anyway, it, uh, just a remarkable life, no question. And, yes, uh, undoubtedly we'll all miss him. Gardzi, we'll miss you. We'll say bye to you. You've got kid duty now. So thanks for the uh, first segment. Uh, it'll just be Coach and I the rest of the way. Um, they didn't call the cops, so that's good. Uh, you're no police. Go in and, uh, go in and get the kids. Well, I'll say one last thing. Uh, coach probably doesn't know this, but every gopher coach before P.J., Sid considered a brother and like you say that he's he once said about a former coach he was like a brother to me and the coach I think was 50 years younger than he was so he's a he was a brother to you even though uh, you're not yet quite 40 right around there so uh, he was a brother to you and I know uh, I know he you meant a lot to him as well I'm like a great 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 grandchild to that man I guess <laughs> I kind of down the total pull a little bit but yeah, pretty cool all right guards we'll talk to you uh, next week on the show thanks guys on Saturday. Coach, you hang tight. Uh, we've got uh, the rest of the show to stick around, so we'll talk Michigan and we'll talk Minnesota. That's all straight ahead. It's Gopher Football Weekly with P.J. Fleck from Learfield IMG College. Welcome back. at segment two of Gopher Football Weekly with P.J. Fleck. Mike Grimm with you, along with the head coach. Uh, Garzi was with us for a segment. He had family duties for the rest of the show. We want to thank Sunbelt Business Advisors. They want to be on your team when you buy or sell a business. It's Onward for Business, the one-stop shop for buying or selling your business. Also for payroll, insurance, bookkeeping, and more. Onward, Sunbelt Business Advisors. Proud to sponsor Go for Football Weekly with P.J. Fleck. Well, it is game week, Coach. It's exciting. It's uh, the first one, obviously, of the season. It's a little bizarre. We're the last week of October, getting close to the last week of October, and it's game number one. It's for the oldest trophy in college football. Um, game days in town. This is, this is all uh, kind of cool here to get going in, in a season that we weren't sure what happened six weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, wait, what a way to start the year, right? I mean, college game day, back-to-back -back home games for the fifth time in college game day uh, history, which says it's monumental. I mean, that says a, a, an enormous amount about where our program's headed, how people view our program, the perception of our program, the perception of Minnesota and the University of Minnesota, and to our fans, our student body. This is for them. I mean, they, they showed up in droves last time uh, in that snowy, cold weather against Wisconsin. I know the result wasn't what everybody wanted, but, you know, they don't, they don't come back to places that, you know, maybe they just, don't, they, just, they just don't have a great experience. So I think it says a lot to our fans, uh, to our alumni, uh, to our, uh, our, our, our campus, uh, everybody involved from the faculty to all the players. You know, this is a very special moment for us and another chance for us to, put, uh, to, to display our university. Uh, our faculty, our, our players, our culture, our city, our state. It's another way for everybody to get excited about go for football. Uh, I think it's wonderful that the oldest rivalry in college football, you know, it, it, the, the oldest trophy uh, is uh, we're playing for that in game one. It's going to be really exciting. Uh, there's a lot of challenges for, for 2020. We all know that. Um, you got kids that lose three games and you got to make them feel comfortable, got to make them feel excited. So you're, you're talking about those kids about next year, you know, you're, you know, they're only going to play in five games at the max this year already. So you're sitting there saying, Hey, listen, don't worry. That's, that's the re that's the reason why you get this year back and you got to get your set side on next year too. And it, it's a combination of making sure everything you're doing right now benefits this football team, but also making sure guys know that there's also this, this preparation and there's going to be times where you know we're playing guys that you know that that due to coronavirus uh are you know that maybe aren't ready but it's going to prepare them for 21. so there, there's benefits and positives to all of it uh and they have to look at it that way so there's decisions you make i guess really not even decisions grimmy it's more of just things that are going to happen that not only prepare us for 20 but also prepare us for 21. So there's that unique balance of that and, and mindset of these kids because they're working so hard and then something outside of their control they get. And just because they get doesn't mean they're doing the wrong things. Uh, they can be doing all the right things and still get it. So there's this mental approach of coaching, of being a psychologist that you got to keep their mind focused on now. But there's some you got to focus on their mind then because they're going to have that, too. And, it, you know, it's not the end of the world. And that's why the, you get the year back and. So I guess it's not necessarily decisions you're making for next year, but there's things that are going to happen this year that are only going to help you now 
and help you in the future. It's, it's one of the most unique years because of that. Yeah, and later in the show, I want to ask you about the, the, the eligibility rules and, and, and get you to you know, clarify some of those rules because I think there is some confusion out there about what it means. But I do want to stay on topic here with the game for now this weekend and game day and uh, Michigan and all of those things. And I know Guardsy asked you last week about uh, – last week we knew that it was uh, going to be a primetime game. And then you factor in three Friday night primetime games. That's a minimum of four opportunities. And you think about those Friday games, you're going to be the only game on national TV, right? I mean, that's it. There's, uh, if someone wants to watch college football on Friday night, on those three nights, they're going to watch the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Uh, game day coming to town. So you, you answered that last week about all of the primetime stuff. What's game day? And you, you hit on it a little bit, but, but what can that mean as well from a, uh, an image standpoint to, to build the brand, as you like to say? Yeah, well, right now, I mean, that's, uh, you know, when you talk about 2020 football, I mean, when you get a chance to host college game day, that's a huge deal. It's a huge deal for exposure of the university academically. It's a huge exposure for the university athletically, socially, right? That you also get to be able to show your state off. You'd be able to show your, your city off. Uh, and we've had some really hard times uh, in, in the Twin City area. Uh, in this past offseason with the, the racial injustice and things that are going on. It's, 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 it's a chance for people to rally back together and, and come together in a very positive moment of, uh, of strength, of courage, of being able to come together for something way bigger than all of us, which we're all doing in the social injustice part uh, of the HERE campaign and everything else. But now it's a way for athletically, which have been removed from our life for so long, now we're able to implant that as well, and that can be able to stir that connectivity when maybe our whole world's been trying to pull us apart for a long period of time. This is an opportunity for all of us to be able to come together. So it's a little bit more uh, in, in that realm. And then when you look at it in recruiting, you look at it through our players of what we're saying we're building here, it continues to verify the process and the proof of what we're doing and building a champion pro championship program here at the University of Minnesota and getting back to those days of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And that's what we're building. That's what we want to build. And, it, and when you get college game to here, it's, it's affirmation of, of, hey, we're doing the right things. You know, we're on, we're on the right track. People are noticing of what we're doing. And not only that, you know, we have one of the greatest recruiting classes in the history of the school during this pandemic. And it only elevates that for not only the, the next class, but the next class after that. Uh, because you're always building and protecting and evolving your brand, uh, not only just on the field, but off the field as well, of how you're going to become this educational life program, not just a football program. And I think game day exposes a lot of that in a very positive light. And there's so much to cover in our program that I think that's really positive. And it, it takes all of us. It takes the faculty. It takes the coaches. It takes the players. It takes the, the people that, you know, that are the farmers in the state of Minnesota. It, this is about all of us. And that's what's so fun about College Game Day. It encompasses the state of Minnesota, what the Gophers are all about, the Big Ten program in the state, the only one Division I-A program in the state. That's what's really it, it's so exciting. And it encompasses that one Minnesota-type philosophy. Well, I wanted to ask you, too, in relation to that, because I know the work never ends, right? There's always there's always going to be doubters and naysayers, so that's a, that's a secondary topic here. But the work never ends. But do you, at a time when you got hired, you said, look, uh, we're going to build something here to where people that aren't even Gopher fans are going to start following us. We're going to serve and give. And I see families tweeting out pictures of your players uh, with their sons or daughters that have cancer. And I see uh, sellouts the last two games. I see college game day coming in January 1st. I mean, this year has stunk, but it started well on January 1st in Tampa with a win against a Blue Blood on a New Year's Day bowl game. Do you, knowing the work that never ends, though, do you at least at a moment just kind of sit back at your desk and say, you know what, we're, you know, what I, what I said I'd try to deliver, we're delivering here? No, because you're always delivering, you know. Uh, you always have to deliver. And the minute you stop delivering, you're not going to have a job anymore. Uh, you know, you're right. There are always going to be naysayers and doubters. I mean, I was told when I first got here by a certain person that from the Twin City area, you'll never do that here. Uh, you can't sell out stadiums anymore. Uh, you're, you, you'll, you'll never have that. That's a pipe dream. And our whole vision of how we're going to be able to do this, not like I said that and said, I don't have a plan for that, or we don't have a plan for that as a staff, or Mark Coyle doesn't have a plan of why he hired us. Uh, the biggest plan was even the people who don't like football, they're going to love our program. Academically, we have a 3.56 GPA. Think about that for one second, a football team. 
right? Which most people, when you hear football, you think meathead, meathead, meathead. They only go to school for football. They're given all these opportunities. They're earning everything they get here. Academically, they're putting in the work. It's a credit to Robert Day, Jackie Lenish, our whole academic staff, right? Our tutors, our learning specialists, our interns. But it's also the commitment to living a life bigger than yourself. It's living a life that's important, not only on the football field, but in every other area of your life. These guys are gonna be great husbands, they're gonna be great teachers, fathers, you know, they're gonna be great employees. This is bigger than that. So we want the people, even who don't like football, when we started winning, the Gopher fans, they'll always be there, right? But it is the people who became Gopher fans last year that needed validation, that needed proof that the culture was working. That there's so many people come up to me, I don't even, I didn't follow Gopher football. But I love what Row the Boat meant because I lost my dad to this. Or, you know what, I lost a child at birth. Or I lost a child. And your story and Row the Boat meant a lot to us. So we're connected to your program now. You give us a sense of hope. That's what this is all about. Someday, somehow, someone's going to fire me, hopefully not Minnesota, for losing too many games. That, that comes to all of us. But... I want to make sure whatever that window I have is, the people who are around me, the people who are around our program, the people who invest into our program, the people who believe in our program, because not everybody will, it changes their life. And it becomes a part of their life that helps shape who they are now, on the field, off the field. And that's what this is all about. So did we pack the stadium of Penn State? You bet. Did we pack Wisconsin? You bet. And I, be I bet you if we had an opening game this game, it would have been sold out again. And for people to say it can never be done here, uh, th th I don't understand that. And that doesn't make sense to me. And it didn't make sense to me. It just basically said, well, that person I have to remove somehow some away from my life because that person's not going to be feeding what I need to be able to, to hear. And when we do happen to be there, they're going to say, well, we told you so. You know, oh, I, I was with that person the whole time. Because there's always going to be critics. There's always going to be doubters. And the higher up you go and the more success you have, the more critics you will have. It's not the other way around. If they're talking about you, they're noticing you. And if they're bashing you, they're worried about you. They're noticing you. They're noticing the gophers. And again, that's always going to happen. So again, usually the negative voices are the loudest voices, but we're going to focus on us. We're going to focus on making our people better and taking those negative voices and not ignoring them, bringing them inside our program. Say, listen, this is an example. The higher up you go, this voice gets louder. This is what people are going to say. Because that's not going to be any different than when they have their own family, have their own kids, have their own job, right? They're going to experience that. And if we can educate them now proactively with that, then their life will be better down the road. I know I got on a soapbox right there, but... Um, we're, we're, as you said, we're constantly developing. We, we will never arrive. We will never arrive. Uh, and we'll constantly keep, keep rolling that boat. Well, and along those lines, uh, last week on the show, you talked about, uh, you know, the good news Casey O'Brien got with his uh, screens last week. Um, I saw Tanner Morgan's dad tweet yesterday that he got a big envelope full of handwritten letters from the team. Uh, of course, he's going through some some uh, treatments and some health issues as well. Had a big scare uh, earlier in the year in this crazy year that it's been. Uh, that, that added to, to, to more of uh, this, you know, stuff that wasn't very good. But that's part of those lessons where all of a sudden it's a family and the quarterback on the team's going through something and the team writes letters to, to the quarterback's dad. You know, you're not always going to make everybody happy. You know, you, you, that ju that's just part of being, you know, a public figure. You're never, your decision-making is never going to be able to make every single person happy. But our job as teachers is to educate people how to be able to treat others. Uh, and to be able to spread joy in their life, give joy to others. And people who aren't giving joy and they're just spreading negativity, uh, those are the people that you don't want in your life. Now, they'll be there, and you're going to have to know how to handle those people, but all they want is to take away your joy so you don't do what you do anymore. So maybe they look better because they're not doing that. And I'm not saying people don't do that all over the country. They do, but our program's done this for eight years. Our culture's done this for eight years. You know, when you sit there and think about if somebody is going through a cancer battle and they're going through chemo, radiation, and they get a delivery, and that delivery is from their favorite team, and it's every single player writing a, a note, a personalized note to that person. One, for that one hour of reading those 100 notes, 
if it takes them away from the pain, the suffering, uh, the, 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 the thought of having cancer, um, the, 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 the negativity they felt, the pain they felt, then we're doing our job. We're doing our job as a program, as a culture. Not winning games, right? We're talking about making a difference and an impact of paying something forward down the road to spread kindness, spread joy in a world that's pretty much negative. I mean, everything's focusing on the negative. We're going to trump that by being able to support the positive, right? To be able to find a way to be able to, to spread joy, create, get people off the negative mindset. And, you know, Ted, uh, who's our, you know, who's, who's, who's you know, uh, Tanner's father, who's, 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 who's fighting a cancer battle, Casey O'Brien, and there's numerous people that, that reach out to me, uh, reach out to our players, reach out to our staff members. And we just want to, look, we're behind you. We're rowing the boat with you. We know about what you have. We hope we inspire you by how we play. But more importantly, we hope we inspire you by, by letting you know we love you. And here's a note to just keep rowing the boat. And I've seen the letters our players write. And they're not just like, hey, keep rowing. Signed, P.J. Fleck. It's not that. Uh, they're very heartfelt, sympathetic, personal, emotional notes. Um, but again, it's a way to spread kindness in a very negative time in our society. All right, let's take another break here. Uh, we'll end uh, this topic on that note, and then we'll get into some uh, scouting report. We'll find out about the Michigan Wolverines who come to town uh, on Saturday night. It's a 6.30 kickoff at TCF Bank Stadium. You can hear the game here. We'll have our pregame show with Justin Gard greeting you at 4.30. Go for Football Weekly with P.J. Fleck is sponsored by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. It's the number one health plan for Medicare in Minnesota. Stay with us. It's Go for Football Weekly with P.J. Fleck from Learfield, IMG College. Welcome back. It's Gopher Football Weekly with P.J. Fleck, Mike Grimm, and the head coach. And uh, it was a, uh, a great segment uh, on segment two. Well, segment one was pretty good too, coach. But um, you had one more quick follow-up on, on what you were Yeah, talking. no, I, I thought you did. I thought that was a really fun segment, to be honest, because we talked about positivity, right? Uh, and, you know, we talked from day one is that, you know, how are we going to get this thing to where it needs to be? Because it takes all of us. It takes every single one of us. It doesn't just take a football coach and a player, but the people who don't even love football. Well, we want them to continue to love this program and uh, what's coming out of this program academically, athletically, socially, spiritually, and nobody's perfect, right? But you start looking at what our players are doing socially and you look at what they're doing spiritually and academically and then the on the field success. And, you know, you never arrive, but we just want to continue to keep changing our best. And, um, you know, we appreciate everybody's support. You know, whether you love football or not love football, we appreciate everybody getting behind Go For Football uh, for the most part in uh, in the Twin City area. It, it's been a lot of fun in the state of Minnesota. Yeah, and you think about, um, I remember back to that first day of the year in Tampa when you guys are going on that eight-minute and 47-second drive to close the game out. You got the ball back at 847. I watched that game about once a week, by the way, just to, to recall that because it was such, and that was such, you know, you had the key fourth down and, uh, you know, Mo Ibrahim had a couple of key conversions and you guys just rumbled through that. Um, and during that drive, as it was becoming apparent that you were grinding that game out, uh, you had a great goal for contingent of fans. And they're all, uh, and again, going back to what we were talking about, about things you said you wanted to do with the program and things that you're getting done with all this. Um, I don't know if, uh, if after year one, when, when uh, the general, general fan, when you were five and seven, uh, would have thought in a few years uh, there'd be 25,000 Gopher fans in Tampa all at once going, row, row row as that quarter and that half and that game was closing down to beat Auburn. But that's exactly what happened. It was pretty, I, I have to think as a coach, that was an emotional uh, a minute or two there when you saw everybody down in Florida doing that. Well, everybody wants proof somehow, some way. Everybody wants validation. I mean, it's hard to believe in something. Uh, that's why they call it faith. Some people have faith. Some people don't have faith uh, because it's hard to believe in something that you can't reach out and touch and see. Uh, and especially where, you know, we've had a lot of uh, different changes, different cultures, different coaches, different philosophies coming here, and it's been hard to believe all of it, right? And uh, even with me, and, and I'm not saying that mine's very easy to kind of buy into from day one, um, because it's a lot. But uh, when, when we heard that, and that, that's what got us to where we were. I mean, our fans pulled our team. I mean, we needed everybody to be rowing the boat in that, those stands, and they were, and, and that's what this culture is. Uh, our tradition, Sky Uma, that's what brought everybody together. Their past experiences at the University of Minnesota. But they all took that past tradition 
and plugged it into like the culture inside these walls that's gone out to other people and and that belief system and so um just so thankful to be the head coach here so thankful for our fans uh, that was a really memorable moment uh and you know hopefully we have some more of those as we continue to uh row through the years yeah and the beauty of it to use uh to use a horse race vernacular you, you've we've now taken a little victory lap but now, guess what? You got to get back on the horse, and there's another race this uh, Saturday with Michigan, right? That the work never ends, as we say. Well, yeah. I mean, you don't have the same horses in this Derby as you did last year's Derby. They're right. all new horses, right? So, I mean, th that's exactly what this year is. Everybody always asks me about last year. I mean, last year was last year. That was a different horse. That was a different fingerprint. We are not last year's team. Whatever that means, we're not. Uh, we want to be a better version, right? But we're not. It, there's different. There's there's different personnel there's different challenges there's different depth charts there's COVID-19 there's opt-ins there's injuries there's all these other things we're, we're a different team uh, we had you know everybody didn't have spring ball for the most part so there's challenges there that doesn't mean you can't be better but it's just a different team we're gonna have a different way of winning than we did last year uh, we're gonna have uh, different players that make plays than we did last year we're gonna have different people who are ready to play this year than last year we're gonna have people just getting their first experience this year playing so that's why we're just a different team. So you can't, all you can do is do everything you can today to give yourself the best chance to win on Saturday. And then you, it, you keep stacking up those chances. And even if you do that, it's still not guaranteed, but it gives you the best chance possible. And you want to have the best chances walking into a Saturday environment and game day than you possibly can have. Yeah, no doubt. A quick scouting report on Michigan before we take our final break. Yeah, I, I'm a really good football team. They're a blue blood for a reason. I mean, they got 44 four stars, two five stars. I mean, uh, it, it's they're very talented. I mean, Joe Milton's one of the, uh, you know, kind of a once in a decade type athletes that come through your program. Uh, he's big, he's tall, he's got a huge arm, he can run, very athletic. Uh, not a lot of film on him. We've had to go over the, I think he had 11 plays from last year, and then we went back through his recruiting film and dissected him that way and evaluated him that way, had a lot of our scouts write down how they'd write him up as an NFL draft, strengths, you know, things to be able to improve on, how we can form our game plan. We don't know how they're going to be able to use him just yet, so it's a little bit preparing for ghosts. But Coach Rossi's really good at that. His entire staff's really good at that. Uh, they've got weapons everywhere. Uh, they've got skill everywhere. They've recruited really well over the years. Uh, and then their defense has incredible defensive ends. Uh, they've got some guys we're familiar with on defense, very active linebackers. They're really good. Uh, Grimmy, I don't, I don't know what all else to describe them. It doesn't matter if they you know, got everybody coming back, if they're reloading. It's Michigan. And it's Michigan week. It's a rivalry game. They're very well coached. Jim Harbaugh is one of the best coaches in the country, uh, has coached at every level. Uh, he's a, he's a, he's a masterful coaching mind. You know, we've got our work cut out for us. So uh, it's a wonderful challenge uh, for the little brown jug on Saturday. Little Brown Jug, we'll talk more about that. We'll take our final break right now. We'll have our final segment when we come back. It's Gopher Football Weekly with P.J. Fleck from Learfield, IMG Cal. Welcome back. It's our final segment of Gopher Football Weekly with P.J. Fleck. If you missed any portion of today's show, you can always catch it on demand via the Golden Gopher podcast. You can download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. So we're back on Tuesdays now for the rest of the season. Uh, our flagship here in the Twin Cities, KFN, will air uh, the coaches' show every Tuesday at noon over the lunch hour. Uh, hopefully a year from now, we're back uh, at uh, some location where fans can come out and interact with us. It's always fun during the commercial breaks to see what fans will bring for P.J. Fleck to sign or take pictures and selfies and all of that. But for now, uh, we're on the computer screen and we're on the radio. Some of the stations are time shifting into the evening, so some of you may be listening uh, at nighttime here as well and we thank you for that. Um, we mentioned the Little Brown Jug. I know um, you're spending today, Tuesday, telling the team about the history of that, which dates all the way back to 1903. Yeah, it's an exciting time for our program. You know, anytime, you know, we, we play for four rivalry trophies. And when you talk about that, I mean, you only play eight conference games um, or nine conference games. And when you do that, you know, if you happen to have two trophy games per year, three trophy games, sometimes, I mean, that, that's amazing. I mean, that, that's why you come play college football for those traditional rivalries. We're blessed to have so many of them. We're blessed to have the most in the Big Ten. Uh, and that's why you come to the University of Minnesota to play in games like this, play in rivalry games, trophy games, historic games. That there's so many people who played in this, coached in it before you, that got us to exactly where we are right now. So exciting. 
You, I remember leading up to the Outback Bowl, you talked uh, many times about how preparing for it, there was so much unknown. You knew Gus Malzahn would, would have a lot of, you get three weeks to prepare. Is there some similarities to preparing for this game this Saturday to what it was like for the bowl game? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you got a chance to watch Auburn's team play for personnel. You had a whole season worth of personnel. Now, the type of plays they were going to run, a little bit more of like preparing for ghosts because there's so much time to prepare. And usually you have a little bit more and a lot more wrinkles in a bowl game than you normally do week to week. Uh, but it, it was this is a little bit more difficult because there's a lot of new faces on both sides and both teams. Um, there's the personnel stuff. You can't really dissect the personnel either because there's no game prior to this. So it creates a lot of challenges. There's going to be a lot of adaption on the fly uh, during the game, which, again, that's that's really exciting for a coach. It's really exciting for a team. Uh, as you're preparing for it, it could be one of those, oh, my gosh, how are we going to do this? And then you just do it. Uh, you have a plan for it. You react. And uh, most of that's done proactively, but some has to be done right there on game day. All right, we got some rapid-fire shots here. Uh, we got about three minutes left in the show, and I've got a whole list of stuff I still want to get to. Um, real quickly, can you go over the eligibility rules? I've had a few people text or tweet at me um, what it means. I mean, technically, could Tanner Morgan start five years here for Minnesota now, I mean, if it comes down to it? Oh, absolutely he could, you know, uh, if it comes down to it. Now, I don't know all the specifics on what's going to actually be passed, what's not going to be passed, how many scholarships were going to be allowed or not be allowed. Uh, that's a conversation for Mark Coyle and the decisions he's making for the administration. Uh, but, yes, there are possibilities that, that some of these seniors, if allowed, can come back for another year. So you could have every single person back. And I think it's, I think it's critical to understand that part of what I said was about next year is – you know, if, this, if some of these kids get COVID or they have to be out because of COVID and miss three games, they got to have a carrot in front of them. And part of that is that. So when the, the year not counting, doesn't count for their eligibility. It counts for wins and losses. And we're going out there to go win every game possible, right? But there's certain things you got to keep their minds down the road a little bit too of, of making sure they know this isn't the end of the world either. You know, they're going to be able to play more football later on if some of these seniors have the choice to be able to come back and happen to miss some games too. So that's what I mean about that next year philosophy uh, of making sure that there's some decisions that have to be have to be made as you continue to go forward. And maybe not just decisions, but but things that are going to kind of come up inside the program. Uh, but it's going to have to be allowed. Everybody's going to handle that differently amongst, I think, uh, program to program, how many scholarships are allowed to be able to go over. Uh, that's a conversation for Mark Coyle at a different time. Uh, but we would love to be able to see these guys be able to come back. And does this pertain to just seniors or if I'm a freshman now on your team, I can play the whole year and I could play them four more years after this? Uh, absolutely. Because what that counts, what that means is this year is free, right? For every single person. It doesn't count towards their eligibility. So you could have a six year senior that comes back for a seventh year, be a senior. You can have a true freshman and technically next year, they're still a true freshman. They could still red shirt that year or still have a red shirt in their pocket. So um, it's going to do a lot for, it's going to give you this super freshman class. Uh, there's going to be a super senior class, kind of a super freshman class, where, you know, 40-some, 50-some of your players are going to be freshmen and in that same class, which presents challenges down the road. But, again, there's a lot of questions to be answered, especially with our administration and where we are, um, especially during a pandemic. Um, so, again, but there's a lot of opportunity down the road, too. But we'll see where we are when that happens. Last week, we congratulated Tyler Johnson on his first career start. He had a big day. And then, of course, over the weekend, he had his first career touchdown pass. And how about you think about that kid from Minneapolis, makes well with his local school, uh, and now his first career touchdown pass comes from the greatest of all time, Tom Brady. Uh, two of the 22 starters that are out there on one side of the ball are gophers. All right, how awesome is that? Not only that, they're rookie gophers making a huge impact right, on their football team. I mean, that is awesome. Uh, it, it's so fun to see. And you know what's even more fun for me to see is, is Antoine Winfield Jr. smiling all the time. You know, the reason why Antoine's so successful is because he had every reason when we first got here, and no matter what, what he went through at the beginning when we got here, then his injuries for two years, he had every reason to be negative. He had every reason to leave. He had every reason to transfer. He had every reason to be down in the dumps, and he never was, ever, he handled everything in stride. I'll get through this. I'll keep rowing the boat for off-field things, for on-field things. It was, hey, it was, um, hey, look, it's football. I get football. People get hurt. 
And, there, and it's a great lesson for everybody to keep rowing the boat and never give up. Antoine Winfield didn't play football basically for two years here because of injury and didn't look at it as a negative. Second round draft pick, probably going to be an all pro, probably going to be defensive rookie of the year. It's a lesson for everybody. Congratulations to Tyler. Congratulations to Antoine. We love you. Keep smiling. Keep enjoying football. Keep playing football the right way. Very good. Our time is done. We will see you Saturday. How about that? Game week, Saturday, Michigan and Minnesota. Can't wait. Can't wait. Roll the boat, Sky Ma. Go Gophers. Take care. Right. Sounds good. Gardensy will join us next week. We'll be back next Tuesday. We'll talk to you Saturday. This has been Gopher Football Weekly with PJ Platt from Learfield IMG College.